Welcome to Bits of History. My name is Lee Pulaski, President of the Resurrection Bay Historical Society. This bit of history is about the wreck of the steamship Yukon in 1946. The Yukon was built in 1899 for the Ward Line, named the Mexico. It carried freight and passengers between New York and Cuba. The Panama Railroad Company bought the ship in 1906 and renamed it the Cologne. In 1923, the ship was bought by the Alaska Steamship Company and renamed the Yukon. The Seward Daily Gateway of May 24, 1924, described the Yukon as the largest and most palatial boat on the Alaska run. The vessel has a tonnage of 5,670 gross tons, is 560 feet long, 50 foot beam, and of 5,000 horsepower. The first time the Yukon docked at Seward was May 26, 1924. The Seward Daily Gateway of May 27th reported, The citizens of Seward were lavishly entertained by the crew of the steamship Yukon, while that vessel was in port Monday and Tuesday. The vessel was thrown open for inspection by the public, and last night a dance was given in the spacious social hall. An elaborate luncheon was served in a large dining room at midnight. Twenty-two years later, the Yukon left Seward on its last voyage at 4.30 p.m. on February 3, 1946, under the command of Captain Christian Tronson, with 365 <coughs> passengers and a crew of 131. About half of the passengers were Army personnel returning to the States for discharge. After rounding Cape Resurrection, the ship encountered rough water and a snow squall cut visibility. At 4.16 a.m. on February 4th, the ship struck the rocks just off Cape Fairfield on the western side of Johnstone Bay, about 40 miles southeast of Seward. Captain Tronson ordered the ship to be run forward full speed so as, so as to wedge it on the rocks and prevent it sinking. The ship was about 50 yards from the shore of Johnstone Bay. Yukon had enough lifeboats, lifeboats to carry 545 persons but the rough sea smashed the boats when an attempt was made to launch them. Water flooded the engine room, and soon after the grounding, the power failed. But the radio operator had been able to send out a distress signal, reporting the ship was aground on the rocks, lashed by ground swells and buffeted by a strong, icy surge. But the captain was uncertain as to its exact location. As soon as the first distress signal came in the sewer, Army power barges and tugs set out immediately to help in the rescue. It wasn't until about noon on the 4th that the first ship, the Coast Guard cutter Onondaga, located the wreck. The Coast Guard lighthouse tender Cedar, the USS Curb, two minesweepers from Kodiak, the freighter North Haven, the Army Transport Brigadier General M.G. Zielinski, and several Army and Navy merchant uh, marine barges and tugs many with civilian volunteers on board, soon arrived on the scene. The Onondaga sent a whaleboat to Yukon, and 48 women and children were taken aboard. As they were being taken to the Onondaga, a great wave hit the Yukon, breaking the vessel in two. The stern turned over and sank out of sight. The front half of the ship remained waged, wedged on the rocks. The wreckage around the Yukon made it too dangerous to send the whaleboat for more passengers. An Onondaga took the rescued women and children to Seward. At mid-afternoon on the 5th, a wave washed several crew and passengers off the ship. Some reached the shore, others were picked up by surrounding ships. But ten were lost, and one died after being rescued. The fatalities included six Army personnel, two crew, two crew members, and three passengers. An Army barge and tug were able to shoot lines aboard the Yukon, and shuttled rubber rafts on the lines to remove passengers. That night, sailors from the Zelensky were able to set up a breeches buoy from Yukon to the shore of Johnstone Bay. It appeared unlikely that the ship could survive another night of pounding, and rescue by raft became too risky in the dark. So an effort was made to get as many people as possible to the shore to await rescue. Planes from Elmendorf Air Field carried clothing, medical supplies, fresh water, firewood, and other items to the scene. Some articles were dropped to the survivors on the beach. Others were flown to Seward to aid the returning shipwrecked survivors. 
The people on the beach were rescued on the 6th. On the morning of the 7th, the Onondaga sent word that all the survivors had been rescued. The last person taken off the Yukon was Captain Tronson. Seward was ready to receive the survivors. The injured were taken to the hospital. The local staff was augmented by three doctors and three nurses from Anchorage. Seward residents opened their homes to the survivors. Organizations opened their club rooms. Churches served hot meals. Restaurant work, restaurants worked on 24-hour shifts. Taxi drivers hauled passengers without charge. The February 9th issue of the Seward Weekly Marathon starred its report on the wreck of the Yukon with these words, Only 11 lost. In these words, Lieutenant Garrett Tuck of the U.S. Coast Guard summed up the scope and magnificence of the rescue job accomplished by the remarkable coordination of Army, Navy, and Coast Guard in five days of suspendous, heartbreaking effort following the tragic wreck of the SS Yukon. A reconnaissance of the wreck seen on February 20th found only a few pieces of wreckage on the beach. The bow of the ship had joined the stern at the bottom of the sea. A Coast Guard hearing concluded that not enough attention was given to gathering weather information before the departure of the Yukon from Seward, and some of the navigational equipment appeared to be faulty. Captain Tronson took full responsibility for the navigation of the ship. His license was suspended for eight months. He later returned to his position as a captain and had no more problems. He retired in 1964. He died in 1993. The wreck induced the Coast Guard to demand installation of radar equipment on all ships certified to carry passengers. Some complaints about the conduct of the crew were made, but the investigation concluded that the bad behavior of a few should not tarnish the brave and conscientious behavior of most of the Yukon's crew. Thank you for listening to this bit of history. We have just touched on the highlights of this event. To learn more about the wreck of the Yukon and other interesting events in Seward's past, visit the Seward Museum at the corner of 3rd and Jefferson. <laughs>